intangible cultural heritage are outside of the Western world, the UK, USA, Australia, and so on, those things are not looked upon as being separate. They're all part of one pretty much indivisible cultural heritage with different emphases. But most places in the world do not make the same distinctions that we do. And therefore, that when we as perhaps as archaeologists go to work internationally, we will often find ourselves having to deal with other forms of cultural heritage other than buried archaeology. So it's in that context I come to you today. So the, where I've been working really for 30 years is in the environmental and social impact assessment sector of the environmental impact assessments. And it's based on my experiences over a 30 year career that, that I'm speaking today, but much of what I'm gonna talk about comes from the experiences of a number of other people that I've worked with over the same length of time and who have joined in creating this thing called the Initiative for the Sustainable Development in Africa. And let's just first get the one thing out of the way, and that is standards, which is part of the whole raison d'etre for the session. On the left, um, I've given you the international standards, so-called IFC, EPRD, European Bank, World Bank, and the other IFIs all have international standards or international frameworks or whatever they want to call them, but they're pretty much the same thing, and they're actually all quite similar. But on the other half of the screen, we have the standards that our own institute has developed for everything ranging from professional ethics to desk-based assessment, field evaluation, excavation, and so on. You're aware of all of those. But in order to make my point, I've, I've highlighted the two types. They're really apples and oranges. They're not the same. The types of standards that we use in the UK and which we as members of the institute will apply whenever we work, anywhere we work, are really not at all the same things as the so-called standards promulgated by the international financial, financial institutions. They do very different things. And therefore, when we work outside of the UK doing anything other than archaeology, there are very few detailed standards that we can rely upon to guide us in doing the things that we do. So as soon as we step outside of the familiar terrain of buried archaeology, we may be somewhat at a loss. But let's go back to the main theme. Let me resume the main theme, which is back to the ESIAs. So the purpose of ESIAs, of course, is to assess and predict the potential adverse or beneficial social and environmental impacts and to develop suitable mitigation measures. The benefits are supposed to accrue nationally to a whole country, perhaps by the exploitation of mineral resources, but they're also designed to accrue locally, and surely this is important that they should do so. And the ways that these can accrue are often touted as being employment, land values, local laws and adjudication, and so on. But the problem is that a large number of practitioners with whom I was working over the past 30 years felt that the system and the processes simply weren't working for all the parties involved. Why ESIAs fail in Africa, and more particularly why ESIAs fail local indigenous and descended communities, is the central focus for the Initiative for the Sustainable Development in Africa. Founded in 2020, ISTAF is committed to understanding why anthropological research, which is designed to eradicate the adverse, adverse effects of development projects upon LID communities, often ends up being detrimental to them. The failure to protect cultural heritage and community identity in particular has contributed to social and economic inequities, social psychological stress, forced displacement, forced migration, and conflict. The mistrust of LID communities of ethnographers and archaeologists must be viewed within the context of the historical development of these anthropological subdisciplines as a part of colonial interests and objectives, and the inability of these of these subdisciplines, our inability to disentangle ourselves from the same types of interests and objectives often represented in development projects. The failure stems from local indigenous and descendant communities, we call them LID communities, um, rarely being provided with adequate opportunity to share information about tangible and intangible heritage resources that are significant to them 
as well as about natural resources that they often rely upon for their survival. The LID communities in our terms are distinct from indigenous peoples as defined by the international financial institutions. Also indigenous peoples um, are obviously overlapping with LID communities. The UN organizations, the World Bank Group and the African um, uh, Development Bank and most national governments recognize that historically indigenous groups and people living in rural communities have been disenfranchised by development projects, but by not allowing them to be officially designated as indigenous peoples, then a, a secondary and often subservient set of legal procedures uh, is followed for development projects and hence the foundation for the initiative for sustainable development in Africa. We were conceived in 2020 to make development and conservation planning in Africa more successful and sustainable at the local level. In 2021, we held a workshop in Zanzibar following the PANAF conference. We had colleagues from quite a number of countries, uh, about 25 people in total attended and engaged in the, in the uh, workshop. With the purpose was to examine why ESIAs failed to address cultural heritage and the repercussions of this failure. The, the niche where we see ISTAF sitting is in the overlap between local indigenous and descendant communities, the cultural and the national natural heritage and climate change. We examined the impact of insufficient coordination with LID communities during the scoping planning and development of infrastructure and large-scale conservation projects in Uganda and Tanzania specifically. The Zanzibar Working Group recognized that the power imbalance between the pressure for economic development and the desire to preserve traditional lifeways and traditional places in many East African countries. The Working Group also determined that the tra traditional ways of collecting and presenting ethnographic data are essentially Eurocentric. Cultural heritage specialists need to adapt how they collect information so that it more accurately represents the concerns and the interests of LID communities. The question to ask is, qui bono? Who benefits? Do LID communities, ordinary citizens? When we parachute in as anthropologists or archaeologists, our work probably, although unintentionally, is against the interest of the LID communities that we are interviewing or whose heritage sites we excavate. We recognize the need for national and local governments to work more closely with LID communities starting with involving them in the development of national legislation. The working group also observed that projects are very rarely audited by the IFIs, such as the World Bank Group. Audits need to be conducted regularly to ensure ESIAs are comprehensive, and that management recommendations are that are proposed by cultural heritage specialists are appropriate, practicable, and most importantly, are implemented. We recognized that, um, well, the, the Zanzibar workshop was, was intended, or it is in fact, crafting a policy statement for submission to local and national governments in Africa that explains the value of cultural and natural heritage and how that is important to LID communities. The policy statement is for submission specifically to the African Union, the African Development Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the World Bank Group and other IFIs that support developments in Africa. That draft is now in a second iteration and we hope to have it issued within a few months. It summarizes some of the social issues encountered on projects in Africa when LID communities were not adequately consulted during the ESIA process and cultural and heritage and natural heritage resources which were important to them were not identified and were subsequently damaged or destroyed. The statement will also highlight the value of adequately protecting and managing cultural and natural heritage that is important to LID communities, including providing meaningful employment, maintaining access to irreplaceable natural resources these communities rely upon for craft, food, housing, medicines, and maintaining access to sacred places. Our second phase is to inaugurate a series of pilot studies, the first of which is looking at the joint biodiversity and cultural conservation areas in Ghana. We're working with, in conjunction with Dr. Wazi Apo at the University of Ghana. 
The intention is to maximize the potential for ISTAF to make a real difference in how development plans, research management plans, development projects, and conservation programs are implemented in Africa. Where local anthropologists and social scientists and ecologists gather information about natural and cultural resources that are important to LID communities in a pilot study area with no purpose other than to understand how those resources are used and how they are important and to which groups they are important. We anticipate gathering information on the size of traditional territories, how they gather materials, how they process, and how they use the resources. Other LID communities they work with, and in what way, they're all their neighboring communities. Locations of their ancestral cultural sites and other areas <clears throat> that are sacred to them. What is their vision for the good future for their community? With the permission of the participating LID communities, the information derived from the field meetings would be used to develop confidential maps of natural and cultural resources important to each community. These maps will be generated in a GIS so that the data can be shared by neighboring groups and can be overlaid and examined relative to national planning development initiatives. But back to standards. The IFI standards simply aren't working. Convincing the international financial institutions to revise has proven unsuccessful, but we haven't given up. Developing guidance from the bottom up, gaining the support from professional and academic and sectoral groups along the way, and we intend to prove these with one or more pilot studies. In the 2021 workshop in Zanzibar, one of my colleagues, Ibrahim Achal from the University of Dakar, said, Europeans developed modern ethnographic practices to study the lifeways of indigenous groups and report back to their governments and institutions. This information was used to, in quotes, manage these indige indigenous groups when Europeans colonized their territories. Even today, anthropologists and archaeologists are taught the same ethnographic methods as those employed for more than a century. These intrinsically Euro-biased methods result in the documentation of LID communities in ways that favor development projects, regardless of their actual impact upon the affected LID communities. These biases affect the types of information gathered from LID communities, how this information is collected and reported. Given that project proponents and agencies often implement their projects based on the advice of anthropologists, or at least in consultation with anthropologists, the working group expressed a very deep concern that these biases favor project sponsors, who often pay for the anthropological studies, and not the best interest of the LID communities. Fundamentally, anthropologists need to change how they work with LID communities to accurately represent community concerns and interests. Although 40 years have passed since anthropologists began scrutinizing the Eurocentric biases baked into our traditional ethnographic and archaeological processes, we continue to struggle with adequately representing the interests of LID communities in our, in our anthropological investigations and when we contribute to ESIAs. Archaeologists and ethnographers who work on ESIAs must, must much more diligently implement a multivocal approach to their studies and insist that members of LID communities be provided with the opportunity to contribute to the development of the terms of reference, as well as be actively engaged throughout the entirety of the, of the ESIA process, from early planning through scoping to the technical studies, identification of impacts, development and implementation of management recommendations. To accomplish this, the ESIA process must be updated to include provisions for LID communities and anthropologists to contribute to the tours terms of reference, and also be provided the opportunity to review the final ESIA and associated management documents to ensure that they accurately represent the findings and recommendations detailed in the technical reports. Finally, we need to ensure that the terms of reference and ESIAs are presented in a language that LID communities can understand. As a final word, the founders of ISTAF, the National in the Initiative for Sustainable Development in Africa are notably white, Western, and older, and arguably unable or unlikely to fully escape the post-colonial world in which their 
our originate, in which our work originated, in which we were trained and have worked for decades. So in parallel with the above, the more immediate concern for most of us is to transfer the authority and responsibilities of ISTAF to our younger African colleagues who are developing a series of problem statements and strategies to begin, whoops, sorry for the typo, problem statements and strategies to begin influencing middle ranking decision makers in their own countries to begin, to begin generating support. Well, I'm afraid that's a very, very brief introduction and I'm sorry I'm not there to answer questions, but if anybody is interested, there's my email and I'd be very happy for you to email me and I'll explain as well as I can what we are doing and what we hope to achieve. Thanks very much for your attention and I hope you enjoy the conference.